Well, hello again everybody. Today we're going to be taking a look at this Lafayette HE40. Or is it? Well, I say that because this radio actually goes by quite a lot of names. We could also call it a Hallicrafter S120. We could call it a Starline SR40 or a Star DX Mate. We could also call it a Starlight A120. And yet another radio which was remarkably similar to this was also the Heathkit GR91. And when this radio was released in England it also went by the name of the Lafayette Ham 1. So as you can see this thing's had more reincarnations than Dracula. So I'm not exactly sure what to call it. So just taking a look at the front panel here. I can't actually see any obvious manufacturer's markings. But uh, as I've often said the best thing that you've got to do is just like a Barnsley girl. We're just going to turn around and just have a close look at the bottom before we go any further. Okay so we've got a little bit of maker's information. So it does say it is a Lafayette radio here. And uh, I think it says it was... Well, it's got the name on it, Jericho Turnpike, I don't know, that Sosset, something like Sosset in New York. But I have it on good authority that all of these uh, radios were actually manufactured in Japan, certainly to the best of my knowledge, and they came out of what was also the, uh, the Trio factory. So again, the first time I saw this radio, I actually thought it was a Trio radio. So just taking a look at the labels on the back here, it looks like we've got the antenna connections. Oh, they're a bit wibbly wobbly, aren't they? They're going to fall off at any moment. And somebody's helpfully written on E and A, although it does actually say ground and antenna, but yep, somebody found the need to get a marker pen out. We've also got um, some maker's information, so it does say Lafayette Radio. Now, it says Jericho Turnpike and... Uh, it looks like something like Sty Style Set, I don't know, New York. So, you know, it's kind of claiming to be an American radio, but, uh, you know, I have it on pretty good authority that all of these radios did actually come out of Japan. And uh, these actually came out of the same factories used to manufacture the, uh, the Trio radios, which later uh, went on to become Kenwood. Not to be confused with the American Kenwood Mixer, of course, that's, that's a different company. So when I first looked at this radio, I actually thought it was a, a trio before I knew differently, because it does carry a lot of what I would call trio distinctive styling. So we've got some other labels on it. I'm guessing there would have been the proper badge here describing the model number, but that's fallen off. We've got what looks like here a control for adjusting zero adjust, so that's the, the S meter, the power meter for the front. And then we've got a label, 240 volts, power consumption, 30 watts, and uh, yes, made in Japan. Uh, you can also see we've got a bodgy switch on the back, so clearly that's not original. I think these rather sad and pathetic looking clips here, I think these might be for the mains cord that would have been wrapped round. I can see the remains of a mains cord there. Let's turn it back round and have a look at the front. So we have got an S meter on the front which has uh, lost its front protective glass so uh, hence the uh, little pointer here for the S meter is just blowing along in the breeze here so uh, yeah we're not really expecting that to work especially after it's been uh, flicked backwards and forwards by somebody. So just having a look at the knobs on the front of here, I think we have got a mismatch of knobs here. None of these look as though they're actually original based on the pictures that I've seen so far. And uh, actually some of the knobs are so big they actually cover up the lettering behind them. So we've got a band spread here, which, uh, yep, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, tuning controls, they don't feel particularly smooth. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like trying to drag a squirrel through a cheese grater. They're horrible. Uh, we've got, we've got a volume pot which uh, is absolutely solid. Wow, that is heavy. That's got to be the, one of the most gummed up pots I've ever seen. We've got a BFO which turns nicely. Now it says here, phones. Well, uh, it hasn't got any phone socket anymore, has it? But it has got this quite nice jeweled red light. Yeah, that's probably a power on indicator, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure. Then we've got our band selects. And the way I understand that this works is basically this is a ham radio receiver. But the first band here, it's for the domestic broadcast range, and that works with a ferrite rod in the back, which we'll take a look at. And then we've got the other ham bands here. So let's have a look at the bands. So we've got, we've got 1.6 megs to 4 megs, so that's going to, uh, that's going to cover 80 metres, isn't it? 
we've got 4.5 to 11 so that's uh, that's covering the uh, 40 meters band and then we've got the 20 meter band and 20 meter 15 meters and the 10 meter band so uh, it's going into CB over there isn't it so uh, yeah maybe we could resolve some American or some well it's, it's legal in Britain now maybe even resolve some AMCB here in the UK because it has got um, a BFO so in theory we can pick up sideband can't we now of course I did actually say that this is a ham radio receiver and because it's a ham radio receiver of course everybody knows what a ham radio license is it's basically a license that allows you to just bugger around with everything so as we can see somebody has gone ahead and they've uh, replaced the phone connector with I've got to admit it's quite nice it's a proper glass indicator lamp so I'm guessing that's going to be a power lamp so that's quite nice and uh, of course we turn it round again of course we did see that it's got this switch on it and of course the uh, the back is hanging off so it's had a lot of people fiddling about in here well I'm going to be another one now before we go any further and take the cover off I have just got to give a shout out to one of my friends which is George Christopher I think you all know George he's a fellow youtuber and has a, a very popular YouTube channel where he looks at all manner of things and uh, tends to set them on fire and what I suggest you do is actually stop watching my video and go and subscribe to George's channel immediately because there is a lot of fun to be had there. So the other weekend keeping safe social distancing measures in place my friend George Christoffi came over and dropped by the All The Gear No Idea workshop and of course we had one of those mutually assured exchanges of junk where he loaded his car onto my driveway and while he was looking I emptied my shed into the boot of his car. But at the end of the day, one man's junk is another man's treasure, isn't it? So I'm really pleased. It was it was lovely for uh, George to give me this because he knows that I've got a special place in my heart for uh, crappy radios. And uh, yes, this definitely does fit the bill of uh, a crappy radio, doesn't it? So as you can see, it looks like our ferret rod has been bodged in with the aid of some... Uh, waxy paper and hot melt glue and uh, it's up to the usual standard of uh, you know a typical radio amateur i.e. it's been uh, bodged so we're going to have to uh, going to have to undo that before we can get the back cover off aren't we so uh, let me find a little screwdriver now i've got no idea if this is the uh, the original ferret rod um, or not it could be not sure but i certainly don't think it would have been a uh, held on the back cover like this this looks a bit of a mess actually doesn't it at least the ferrite rod isn't actually broken in half so that's a plus isn't it oh that's a shame I see the antenna connections falling apart but we can fix that now we could do with just doing something with that couldn't we temporarily sticking it back before it rips all the wires out it looks as though well one of the wires has already fallen off it. it's all looking very fragile that snippy snippy snip 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 Snip. Well, I've got to admit, I'm not exactly sure how we get this uh, radio out of its case, but I'm guessing we've got to uh, just do a little bit of denobulation, and once we've denobulated it, maybe we can uh, withdraw the whole thing out. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Do we have to denobulate it? Maybe the plastic panel comes out with it. So the way I think that this works is the ferrite rod is actually only used on band 1 which is the broadcast bands. I think all other bands use the uh, the normal antenna connector here. Uh, well to be honest I would rather listen to the broadcast band than uh, well, the usual you know, ham radio who wants to listen to the prostate net every Tuesday night or whatever. Yep. Okay. He said, I've got so far. Ooh, lots of crunchy noises. <laughs> oh, it comes with a free obscure piece of brown plastic. Okay, good. Okay, well it came out of the chassis without too much of a fight. Now the first thing that I generally do with a valve radio, in fact any radio, is you can see we've got the variable capacitor here on the uh, 
on the VFO what I'm doing is I'm just closing the capacitor up I'm fully meshing it because if you look at the one that's I'm guessing this one is the band spread capacitor here you can see it's fully open at the moment now it'd be very easy to uh, accidentally catch one of these with a screwdriver or a tool or rest my hand on it uh, we don't want to do that because we can bend the plates and do damage so let's just mesh that up as well and of course it is quite a nice feature that to have a band spread it does mean that we'll be able to uh, hopefully we'll be able to resolve some SS, uh, SSB signals so taking a first look what can we see well we can see it's actually oh, it's actually very very dirty so actually I think this has been in a smoker's house because the dirt doesn't rub off it's almost like creosol it's sticky and horrible so we need to give the chassis a good clean I can see uh, I can see a bridge rectifier here that's very how you're doing isn't it and uh, it looks as though somebody's put a, a full wave rectifier in there uh, I doubt the original was a full wave but I haven't really had a look at the circuit as I say most of the circuits that I found for these they actually show a large mains dropper resistor uh, because a lot of these sets were actually AC DC sets and the a lot like radios like the DAC 90 they had a large dropper resistor now this one has actually got a transformer installed in it I don't know if this transformer is original or not I'm going to say that this isn't an original one just from the state of the wiring we can see that it's a uh, yeah again it's just a little bit how you're doing whether it functions or not we have no idea but we'll have to take a close look at that now there was a switch on the front which you can see that I've cut the wires off it. I'm guessing that maybe this is the feed to the uh, output transformer. Probably goes back to the... does that go to the speaker? Okay so that was some form of a speaker mute. So we'll probably just temporarily solder them wires back together. Not oh, the speaker. I don't know. Is the speaker not original? It certainly feels very loose. Do we dare turning it over and having a look inside the chassis? As I say, you never know what you find through a ham radio because they just can't keep their hands out of them. Um, and they do like to do the little modifications and improve them. And by improve them, I mean totally bugger them up, of course. So taking our first look under the chassis, the first thing that I can see is I can see this red power lamp that was bodged in. It was actually stuck in into the phone connector. Now I don't like um, wiring bodges. Um, well, I'm not going to say it's a bodge, but actually it is a bodge, isn't it? Look at the state of it. Um, I don't like dealing with other people's work. It can cause you nothing but problems, so we're going to get rid of that right away. So snippy snip snip and uh, yeah it's just tied around everything that's horrible isn't it so just looking at the wiring I think this has been modified I suspect when it was actually born it was an AC DC set with maybe a dropper resistor in it somewhere but just looking at the quality of a lot of this mains wiring it certainly doesn't look a uh, doesn't look original it's not really inspiring with confidence oh here's the original wire with the original mains power wire which is a uh, Oh, it's almost crunches when you uh, when you cut it. Let's get rid of that. That's horrible. And uh, cut that one. Yeah, <laughs> really crunchy that. Oh, a mess. So I can see we've got two large electrolytic capacitors, and these have got the RS brand on them. So I'm suspecting that these are actually quite a lot newer. Although I don't know CB73. I wonder if that's a date code for 1973. It could be. I'm I'm rubbish at capacitor date codes but that could be right around 1973 so it looks like we've actually got the main smoothing capacitor that's still down here attached to the bottom of the chassis here uh, but we've got another two 32 microfarad capacitors that have kind of just been bodged in again um, that's not an unknown bodge a lot of people like to put additional smoothing on here so these are a, a relatively new replacements I can see a large a large resistor here which is around one kilo ohm and this is reminding me again it's reminding me a lot of the trio set so I'm guessing that this uh, this radio would have actually employed uh, a CR smoothing circuit so it would be a capacitor in series with a resistor that's then in parallel with another capacitor so that's a that's a mains hum reduction technique Looking at some of the other capacitors in here, a lot of these are in metal cans. So at first glimpse you think, ah, oh, well, these are uh, electrolytics, but of course they're not. These are just paper capacitors and they're actually in a, in a metal can. Now, when I did the uh, original Trio radio, 
I actually took a number of the capacitors out and uh, I tested them. Now I put them on a capacitance meter and they actually most of them measured good but as soon as I started to put them onto my mega meter and put 100 volts on them they were leaky as anything. So again if we decide to uh, restore this radio I think that I would probably go ahead and uh, well I'll certainly test a few of the capacitors and what I like to do is I don't just like to change every capacitor in sight, although I'm not opposed to doing that. I think there can be good reasons for doing it. So what I would recommend you do is, before you just go ahead and change every capacitor in sight, although that's not necessarily a bad way of doing it, I've done that myself, what I like to do probably these days is, I will try to test as many of the capacitors as I can, but if I find a bad one, if you find one bad capacitor, they're all made around the same date, um, I would change the lot out. You find one bad, change the lot out. Electrolytics, um, I know what some people say about um, reforming and all the rest of it. Occasionally I will reform one, but all, only on a piece of equipment just to temporarily get it going. If it's a piece of equipment that you're planning to keep, you know, this piece of uh, equipment's coming up for 50 years old now. Um, electrolytics, the life of an electrolytic is around 10 years, so it needs changing out. Even if it measures good, you should just change them out. And I'm just looking at a resistor down here and that looks as though it's actually really badly uh, melted at one end so I don't know what's gone on there. I've got absolutely no idea what this uh, on and off switch has been lubricated with but it is absolutely solid. I'm afraid this girl's looking like a cheap night out so she's not getting the good stuff, she's getting some service oil rather than deoxid. Oh, and of course that just runs not down the tube fail. And of course these uh, these cans have specially been developed to uh, actually deliver as much spray as possible so that um, they're not very big cans and they want you to use as much as possible and buy more. So the idea of this is uh, it's probably been lubricated in the past with WD-40. Over a period of time that WD-40 goes absolutely solid, it congeals and uh, when it does that it, it goos up the pot. So can we make that move any easier? Unfortunately it is a sealed pot this, it's not very easy to get access to. Can we see any of the switches? I'm a great believer. The first thing that I do when I have a radio, you can you can waste an awful lot of time with bad connections, so just go ahead, clean all the switches. It takes a few seconds and it can save a lot of head scratching. And of course we've got a band select switch here which is looking pretty crusty so that needs a spray. So I've just returned to our on off and volume switch and I've got to admit I really am just really quite amazed at quite how crusty this. I think this is the uh, one of the most jam potentiometers I've seen in about 10 years. God knows what they've put in here. I think it was maybe old motor oil or something. Maybe out of the Morris Minor. Something equally crappy anyway. It doesn't seem to be uh, responding that. What we'll probably have to do is, uh, if it looks like a win of this radio, um, well, I think the best thing to do would actually be to just replace this pot with another one. But uh, if I, in the case that I'm just too tight to do that, what I'll probably do is we'll open this up and uh, strip it all down and uh, lubricate it properly. Oh, and I've just realised one that I've forgotten down here, which is the little potentiometer for the, uh, the S9, for setting the S9 mark. The lever of bodgery in here isn't totally insane, we have seen worse, haven't we? Hmm. So just taking a look at our mains transformer here, I've just spotted another delightful feature. And uh, of course what I'm referring to is the way that the, uh, the mains wiring here, this is probably the neutral, because again common to uh, a lot of these sets, they seem to employ neutral switching. So this blue wire here goes to the switch. And of course they've, uh, they've been very careful to actually wind it around the uh, connections here for the uh, the rectifier valve because uh, that's always great isn't it to potentially mix up incoming AC with your HT wiring and uh, yeah it's also kind of wrapped around the 6.3 volts that was supplying the uh, the filament so yeah that's uh, 
That's that's factory, that isn't it? That's great. Mm. And of course, taking a close look at this transformer, we can clearly see that no expense has been spared because it's actually been fully lightened because it actually had a corner here which uh, was maybe in the way of this wheel here, this pulley wheel. So uh, what they've done is, uh, well, they've actually, well, they haven't used an axaw because obviously a true craftsman just uses a pair of pliers and just breaks it off. So yeah, we've got some weight reduction going on here. Yep, they've uh, they've saved that little piece of bakelite. So no doubt this radio will now just go that bit faster. That's that's a nice feature, isn't it? Well, of course, I've done my fair share of complaining already, but I actually have to say that I am actually quite a big fan of these uh, these radios. You know, these radios that actually this is a Lafayette, but it clearly came out of that trio factory and maybe it was i'm guessing it was designed in house by uh, the trio factory whoever they were i don't know if they were called the lucky star company or something like that uh, i can't quite remember off the top of my head but one thing much like the trio 9r we looked at a few weeks ago in some ways these are a perfectly laid out receiver you know if you wanted to have an understanding of how a radio worked and uh, actually to twiddle with it yourself it's beautifully laid out it's very honest and it's very very easy to understand how it's put together uh, one thing that is beautiful is that all the actual uh, valves are all they're all actually stamped in all this all the numbers are actually stamped into the chassis which is a nice feature as is all the IF cores it tells you what they are they're all stamped in there just looking at we can just see here we've got OS so obviously these are the trimmer controls for the local oscillator for each band so again completely and easily accessible and then down here we've got the antenna trimming front end adjustments here so that's nice uh, can see we've got both our IF transformers here I'm guessing they're both IF transformers mains transformer we've already taken the mic out of and then just tucked away in the bottom corner here we've got a little tiny audio output transformer and as I understand the the audio output from these radios is about 1.5 watts that's what it's designed to be now I normally do like to give radio chassis a bit of a squirt with WD-40 because normally just giving them a rub with that brings them up uh, beautifully but yeah actually in this case whatever this stuff is coated in which I'm thinking is probably nicotine or something like that it's actually um, it's quite resistant to the WD-40 actually it's actually quite difficult to clean this stuff off but uh, I'm not trying to get it perfect I'm not one of these uh, restorers who polishes the chassis I just don't want my fingers covered in filth whenever I work on it now apart from just cosmetically improving the radio there is actually a lot of advantage I think to spending a bit of time cleaning a radio like this because when you clean it you're actually looking at things and what I found is that I actually find a lot of uh, mistakes and problems that need rectification when you actually take some time to clean a radio you spot things that you wouldn't have spotted if you just went ahead and plugged it in so uh, again I'm gonna just carry on giving this a bit of a clean okay so I'm just removing our mains indicator lamp at the moment this isn't original it's actually fitted into one what was the uh, the phone socket so uh, yeah well you can see this radio has come with all the safety features in that yeah somebody's very carefully wrapped this in a self amalgamating tape which is a uh, yeah that's, that's nice that's special so I'm wondering is this a neon indicator or is it a bulb looks a lot like a bulb rather than a neon but I've got to admit I'm not exactly sure okay we darren guaranteed to cut off the uh, dial card now aren't I come on come out Something went crunch there. What was that? Okay, that was a resistor. So this is obviously a neon indicator, but we should be able to get this off now. So I've gone ahead and I've removed our little retrofitted mains lamp, and uh, I've got to admit, well, it wasn't a lamp, was it? I think this is a neon indicator, although it's unusual to see a neon with uh, such a pretty red um, glass, kind of like a what would it be? Like a ruby, ruby glass. Um, bezel on it it is really quite pretty that but um, yep it's not original so that needs to go did you think so snip 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 well those capacitors that I just cut out they weren't part of the original radio circuit they were something that was added at some later date now there is actually the original main smoothing capacitor down here which is a two section 8 microfarad capacitor rated at around uh, 
450 volts so let me just see what these are coming up as okay that's coming up as 15 microfarads and that's coming up as 15 microfarads as well so both of these capacitors are actually reading about double their rated uh, capacitance value now the ESR is actually very low but it just goes to show you that ESR isn't the only measurement uh, the ESR is coming up low at 0.57 microfarads but the fact they've doubled in capacitance value means that they're not particularly good now I was just about getting to the stage where I was actually going to power this radio up and uh, I was just having a look round at the new valve that I was going to install which is this output valve which goes in this socket here so I was just doing some final checks and I noticed that this uh, this capacitor and this resistor here these were actually just blowing in the wind and uh, not actually connected to anything so where this uh, where this what this resistor is at 150 ohms and this 22 microfarad capacitor this is a cathode bypass uh, resistor capacitor network here and uh, in theory this should actually be connected to pin 1 or it has certainly been connected to it in the past but it looks as though for some reason somebody's actually connected the output from the BFO to pin 1 and if I look at all the other pins on here basically for example the top anode which goes to our output transformer that should be connected to pin 7 but it's actually connected to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 so something's gone on in here some at some point what I suspect has happened uh, somebody didn't have the right output valve and so what they've done is they've actually rewired the radio to work with maybe a different type of valve that they did have now I'm not sure what valve that would have been to have uh, the, the particular pinouts that they've wired to but certainly if I'd have just powered this radio up with the uh, the valve in as it was wired up it probably would have blown up my output valve what I'd quite like to do is before I do go any further I want to know if this radio will work at all if it actually does anything so I think what we'll actually do is we'll we'll find the uh, the audio output the demodulated output from the detector I think we'll we'll use my signal tracer and what we'll do is we'll have a dab round with a signal tracer and then at some point in the future if it looks like there is some life in this radio Radio, what we'll do is we'll come back and we'll rewire this valve socket to the correct pin out for the valve that we're going to put in because I say the valve that I'm going to put in is uh, I think it says I can hardly read it very small writing it's a, a 6 CU5 valve which is a 6 volt kind of equivalent of the 50 C5 valve which would have been in there when this was uh, designed to work for the 120 volt market to see I've gone ahead and I've hooked up the uh, 230 volt supply to this and uh, again I was thinking about the label on the back of the panel that it did say that this radio was originally 240 and I think what maybe these sets had in them was a 230 to 110 volt auto transformer but I haven't actually managed to find a drawing or a circuit diagram that actually shows that arrangement so I'm just kind of guessing but certainly back in the day this probably was a, a 230 volt supply so the shenanigans down here with this uh, output pentode valve I don't know what that's doing so I'm just going to ignore that for now ok we've got the electrical pixie detectors on the bench so this one we're going to use just to measure the I think we're going to use this one to try to measure the, the filament voltage going to the, uh, the heaters of the valves and then we're going to use this meter here to detect uh, the HT voltage coming up and because this is using a solid state rectifier we don't actually have to wait for the rectifier valve to warm up to uh, develop some HT so that should come up right away and in some way that's better now we think that these capacitors down here are pretty bad really especially the electrolytics but I'm hoping it will fire up this once without exploding in my face but we will see and uh, on this meter here uh, we're up at 14, 15 volts already, 20 volts, so the DC is coming up. We have also, as you can probably see, got a lamp limiter in circuit. That isn't doing anything at the moment. And I do just want to just check some of these filament voltages, so let's put that on AC. okay two volts so that's fine 
And we've got 6.2 volts on our heaters and uh, 180 volts of HT, which I'm going to call good enough. We should at least get some life out of that. And we will leave that for 10 minutes just to try to uh, see if those capacitors start heating up. I don't think they will. We're not drawing a great deal of watts. At the moment we're drawing 19 watts. Okay, got some BFO action there. Okay, well the radio appears to work. Let's go ahead and let's see if we can rewire this uh, output pentode valve now and uh, see if we can get it working under its own steam. So I think this is one of those jobs where I'm afraid it is going to get worse before it gets better. So. Uh, Okay, so I think this first wire here comes from the automatic noise limiter, so he needs to come off. So the next wire we're going to go in search of is the anode connection to the output transformer, which I'm fairly sure is this one, because that's on the wrong place for this valve. Well, for reasons unknown to me, it looks like somebody in the past had already gone ahead and they cut off this cathode bypass capacitor along with the cathode resistor, so we need to try to... Uh, reinstate that but I'm afraid that yeah all this wiring is in such a mess um, it's hard to know what to tackle first we've got components bodged on top of other components before I can go ahead and start rebuilding this I think I have actually unfortunately just to unleash a little bit more destruction on it because uh, there's so many strange components and bodges on here it's a bit hard to follow the circuit so what I've just disconnected there is the ground connection to one side of the filament. As I say, it's a bit of an unusual arrangement. This to use the chassis return as the, the ground return for the filaments, but that's what's been done. The next thing I think I'm going to disconnect is, yeah, I'm going to disconnect our grid coupling and uh, our grid stop resistor, which are down there somewhere, because, uh, yeah, that's not right. There's our coupling capacitor there, which we need to replace. And uh, here's our 500 kilo ohm grid stopper. I think we're going to pull that off and replace it as well, I think. Just so many wires on top of wires, it's actually hard to see what you're doing. See my grid stopper resistor just trying to escape down there. See if we can snag him before he disappears into the undergrowth. Well, of course, we might not get a perfect soldering job first time round. Uh, you know, quite often you've got to go ahead, do a little bit of work, do a bit of test, and then come back, do, a, do it again. So at the moment, what I'm trying to do is just kind of lash it back together so we can just run it, and then we may or may not come back and tidy it up later. But you, you know the answer to that. We're not probably not going to come and tidy it up, are we? So, uh, yeah. Mm. Now as I've been working on this I've kind of found that there is lots of differences between how this uh, radio chassis has been assembled and uh, what my circuit diagram says here. And uh, there's various differences. I'm not sure whether the differences are due to modifications or whether or not the, uh, you know, the circuit is, is, is just not quite right out of the factory. I'm, I've got no idea. It looks like an awful lot of bodgery has gone on. I can see a lot of connection points which have got solder on, uh, but there's nothing connected to them. So, you know, that's a bit of a giveaway that at some point in the past, uh, things, you know, things aren't quite what they seem. Apart from that, I think we're good to go. I've replaced that capacitor, which is a yellow one there, so that's gone in. But of course, we've still got all the other... Um, paper capacitors to change out so this isn't so much as a repair video I think it's more of a resurrection so hopefully we've done enough to uh, to fire the old girl up so uh, I guess we'd better give it a try so let's just see what's everything set to okay so it's it's on the broadcast band we've got a valve in we've got our lamp limiter in circuit 
fairy uh, axe set to 90% which should be about 230 and I guess we're just gonna give her a go and see what happens fingers crossed everybody nothing come on anything gonna happen oh maybe Oh, we've got a lot of volume, but we've also got a lot of hum, haven't we? Well, hmm. Okay, well we've got a lot of hum there. And it doesn't seem to be uh, being affected very much by the volume control. So, me thinks that's coming into the output valve, perhaps directly, or somewhere else in the circuit. Hmm, what can we do about that? made a difference. Let's try this one. And that doesn't sound too bad now does it? Well, still some hum coming in, but I think that might be equipment in my room. It's quite noisy in here. Certainly isn't very sensitive, this receiver, and to be honest, I think that's probably because it kind of lacks any front-end amplification. The other trio set, the 9R, it's actually got a pre-amplifier. It's got a pre-amplifier valve at the front end. This hasn't, and I think it kind of shows in the performance. Well it looks like unfortunately we're not going to get to the bottom of the hum problem on this radio today. The power supply section here is uh, bears no resemblance to the actual circuit diagram. It's been kind of hacked on quite heavily and uh, there's lots of tag strips and other components that really shouldn't be here. We've gone ahead and we've put some capacitance back on because uh, I think there is some capacitors missing which should have been on the screen grids for some of these valves. So we've gone ahead and we've put those back in. Um, but I think you can see there's still a little bit more work to do. It could also be that a lot of the problems are just down to the way that these valve bases are actually wired, the filaments, that they're using the, uh, the chassis as a return. It's not something I've seen before. So we've got various things that we can play with. If we want to work on this radio again, leave it in your comments. If you don't want to see it again, leave that in your comments as well. But I think until next time, I think that'll do. As always, thanks very much for watching, but bye bye for now. Now I think that'll do.